That's all right. I'll bank the applause now because there won't be any later. Um, well, thank you, thank you ever so much for the opportunity to come and talk to you. But do you want to just take a seat? Is this uh, like when you radio chemistry, did that day in the Rutherford one? It was this kind of little desk and you're like, hurry up. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I, I feel slightly conned into giving this talk, but hey ho, here I am. Um, and I thought I'd just try and put together a few slides about something which I think is interesting, and if you don't, we'll talk. Um, so I want to talk about plutonium, why the UK has it, how we might use it, a bit of the history and what's gone on. Um, and you can have the slides later, Adrian, if you want. <laughs> um, so just some random plutonium-related pictures to start us. I'll begin with a couple of slides explaining why we're interested in this stuff. Um, and I'll really begin with some terminology, just so we're, we're clear that there are three w adjectives that are really significant here. There's fissionable, fissile, and fertile. So fissionable is a nucleus that will undergo fission when it interacts with a neutron, energy undefined. Fissile is a nucleus that will undergo fission when it interacts with a neutron, at thermal energy, so that is a, a neutron which is in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings. Uh, so fissile is a subset of fissionable, and fertile is a nucleus which, when it captures a neutron, will undergo a, a couple of beta decays usually and convert itself into a fissile isotope. And we're interested in fissile isotopes because you can get an awful lot of energy out of a nuclear fission reaction. And there aren't too many to be had. So why plutonium specifically? If you go and dig uranium out of the ground, it's got a bit of a fissile isotope, uranium-235 in it, le less than 1%. The vast majority of the uranium that comes out of the ground is the isotope uranium-238, which is not fissile and therefore for running a power reactor or something is not really that interesting. And there's a third isotope, uranium-234, that's present in tiny, tiny trace quantities. So if I want to do nuclear technology um, and I don't have any access to plutonium, so if I go back to the Manhattan Project, my only option for a fissile isotope is this trace of uranium-235 that I can dig out of the ground. And that's, for many applications, that, that's not enough uranium-235 to actually be useful to me. And um, so I need to go through a really laborious physical process, separating atoms of mass-235 from atoms of mass-238. And it's, it's a tedious process, it's energy intensive, it's, it's a pain to do. Um, and the, process, the processes by which it, this is done are collectively called enrichment. The bottom picture here is an early UK enrichment plant at Capenhurst, which at the time was the largest single industrial building in Europe, 1.2 kilometres long, 150 metres wide, 1,800 kilometres of pipework inside it, a fair amount of it made of nickel, which is an expensive and difficult to fabricate metal. And those cooling towers out to one side of it are the coal-fired power station that you need to build to run your plant. So enrichment is not a simple, cheap, quick, easy process. And in order to make what we call LEU, light, low enriched uranium, which is maybe boosted from 0.7 to three, four, five percent U-235. You go through the enrichment process and to get a ton of low enriched uranium that might be useful for your rack fuel, a byproduct is seven, eight or nine tons of depleted uranium where the U-235 content has been pushed right down. So Enrichment is a monumental pain, but is your only option if you want to do fission based purely on uranium. But the majority of those uranium atoms, the, the 238s, are 
what we call fertile. So if you think of a nuclear reactor just being a big bath of neutrons, and you put U-238 into that neutron bath, then it can capture a neutron, and it becomes uranium-239, which will decay pretty rapidly to neptunium-239, which will decay pretty rapidly to plutonium-239. Plutonium-239 is fissile and has a half-life of 24,000 years. So by neutron irradiating uranium-238, you open up the opportunity to get at fissile material, not through this laborious physical enrichment process, but through chemical separation. And that's attractive. And um, I've not forgot to mention this picture. This is this is the lab bench on which Otto Hahn demonstrated fission back in 1938. Um, so it really is just like your kitchen table with stuff on it. Um, what is interesting is that we went from that demonstration in 1938 through to industrial scale nuclear technology less than 15 years later. So a bit of background there. Um, if you keep your uranium in the, the neutron bath, then plutonium will continue to react with neutrons and the 239 plutonium can capture further neutrons and do other things. Some of it will fission, but some of it will become heavier isotopes. So in practice, when you manufacture plutonium in a reactor, you don't get a single isotope. We'll look at how you can optimize that later. But reactor plutonium will typically have five isotopes in, in varying quantities. And um, the half-lives are here. They vary quite substantially. Four of the five are alpha emitters, one of them is a beta emitter and quite short lived and has the annoying property of decaying to form americium 241, which is an alpha emitter for 30 year half life, but has a pretty pokey gamma ray. So aged plutonium, where the americium has grown in, is actually quite dosy and quite difficult to handle. So. You know, be, be wary if anyone tries to sell you old plutonium. <laughs> and this illustrates the way in which the isotopics change with neutron irradiation. So the, the numbers of what matter, so three gigawatt days per ton is a very lightly cooked fuel. It's a function of the reactor power that the material's been exposed to and the length of time it's had that exposure. So you go from very low burn up to much higher burn up. And you can see how 239, which is the one I'm really interested in, content is highest in low burn up plutonium and steadily decreases <coughs> as you go to higher burn ups. And 240 goes the other way. You start with a relatively low content and you increase. 241 similarly is increasing, 242 likewise. And because the isotopic mix changes as a function of time, so the, the overall rate of decay in that plutonium material will change. And plutonium is self-heating. If you hold a piece of plutonium in your hand, it's warm. Uh, what was it? I think it's Emilio Segre's daughter described as being like holding a baby rabbit. So it's that sort of it's that sort of pleasantly warm and um, and you see that you see this this decay heat number so this is telling you the amount of heat that plutonium produces through its own decay and again as you get to more and more of the sh shorter lived isotopes like 238 240 so you see more and more self heating and what this means when you store it in a can, and we store it in cans of about three, kilo, three kilograms a time, the cans can be quite warm. The centerline temperature, because the form in which it's stored is a rubbish conductor of heat, centerline temperatures can be up in the hundreds of degrees centigrade. So plutonium is very much a self-heating material, and that heat has significant implications if you're going to store it for a very long time. So that's the first phenomenon we need to be interested in. The next is it, it's decaying radioactively. 
So you start with a mix of plutonium isotopes of varying compositions, and this is all based on the on this line here, three gigawatt day per ton magnox. So predominantly 239 with a bit of 240. And the 239 and 240 note the logarithmic scale here. Slowly, slowly, slowly decay away on this because there's only a 100 year time scale. That's a 24,000 year isotope. That's a six and a half thousand year isotope. So they're, they're not decaying very much. But the plutonium 241, for example, is decaying quite substantially over a 100 year time scale. And the americium, which I mentioned, is therefore growing in over that same time scale. Most of the isotopes are alpha emitters, so helium production increases steadily over time. And the immediate decay, and you get into the immediate decay products, things like uranium-235, which is the decay product of blue-239, U-236, which is the decay product of, of blue-240. So you get this, you start with pure plutonium, and you generate a whole mix of other elements and isotopes as a function of time. So we have heat self-heating, we have the appearance of other <coughs> elements and isotopes, and of course, in a solid phase, you'll have radiation damage because it's self-irradiating all the time. So there's an awful lot going on in a plutonium cow. So that's some of the key features of plutonium. Um, where did it begin? Uh, it begins in the Manhattan Project, uh, in 1944-45. Um, a bonus point for anyone who can identify the two Manchester physics graduates on this slide. It's James Chadwick on them. Do you want to say which one? The big six people. <laughs> well, the no. Chadwick's always mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that one's James Chadwick. Oh, I had it on for the lower ones. Yeah. Uh, there to go day four and and uh, that's that's Leslie Groves, who was the guy in charge of the whole Manhattan Project. Chadwick was the leader of the UK um, participants in the Manhattan Project. Um, worked out at Los Alamos, where they fabricated the weapon. Chadwick, you know about. This guy is your other Manchester physics graduate. And I bet nobody knows who he is. Nice try, but no. Uh, that's a guy called James Tuck. Now, what he did was he worked on explosive hydrodynamics. So the using, use of shock waves to manipulate things, initially around anti-armor anti munitions, what they call shape charges. But he went out to the Manhattan Project and he cracked some of their most difficult bomb problems. So this is Fat Man, the plutonium bomb. There's some bits of plutonium as you as you'd have them. And, and one of the things that you have to do with a plutonium device, because you've got this mix of isotopes, is you have to use explosive shock waves to, to compress the plutonium core spherically to achieve detonation. So that requires some really complicated explosives engineering so that you get a symmetrical converging shock wave. It's also why the bomb is pretty much spherical because you've got a bloody great sphere of high explosive around a grapefruit sized piece of plutonium in the middle of it. So this guy, James Tuck, worked out a lot of that hydrodynamics. And um, he was a Manchester undergraduate in physics. He was doing his PhD in Manchester and then part of that to go off and help end a war, which seems like a good reason. And to illustrate that this university is a sympathetic and caring organisation, when he came back and said, I'd like to finish my PhD, they said, no, you've timed out. <laughs> so he never got a PhD. Um, and, he, he went, and he went back off to Los Alamos and I think was assistant, assistant head of um, explosives. So he did all right in spite of that, but I just note the fact that the institution behaved like that to him. Um, after 1945, um, the Americans pulled the plug on cooperation uh, on atomic matters. So suddenly the shutters came down 
a bunch of British scientists and engineers came back from the Manhattan Project. And this gentleman, Ernest Bevin, got a real talking to from the American Secretary of State and basically said, I am never being talked to like that again. We will have a union, a, a, an atomic bomb, and it will have a bloody union jack on it. Go away and make me one, effectively. So that was a government decision in January 1947. They didn't know, there were big gaps in what they knew, but they cracked on. They built the wind scale piles in the begin, very beginning of the 1950s. They separated their first plutonium by the spring of 1952. They built the first weapon by the August, of, in August 1952, and they tested it in the October. So from a standing start to a test in five years. Um, so that's some, some of the instructions, conveniently stamped secret, but lifted off a Pathé News newsreel. <laughs> <laughs> that's assembling a device. That is the unfortunate HMS Plim on which the first test was carried out. They put the bomb in it. Did it they, survive? No, that's what happens <laughs> to your ship. Um, so that was the first test in the Montebello Islands off the northwest corner of Australia. And this is really the, the guts of this early program, which is wind scale. And this is an early photo which really just has the essential bits of the facility. So you have the two production reactors there and there. You have the reprocessing plant where you do your chemistry to get the plutonium back. And you've got some other rather uninteresting huts where a bunch of other stuff is done to turn what comes out of your reprocessing plant into, into bomb components. Um, let's look in a little more detail at making that plutonium. That's a wind scale pile fuel element in its can. So it's a uranium rod in an aluminium can. The fins are to help dissipate heat. The reactor has the fuel channels running horizontally through a big block of graphite with lots of holes in it. This is the charge face. So each of these plugs is at the beginning of a horizontal channel running through the reactor. And most of you are too young to know what shove halfpenny is, but that's essentially how it worked. You kept putting fresh fuel in the front and it was shunting older fuel steadily backwards through the reactor and eventually it fell out the back into a water-filled channel was taken away to do chemistry with. And they were 180 megawatt reactors, so that's a lot of heat. So you blasted air through and you put the air up a big chimney with a filter on the top. And I talked a bit about plutonium isotopics already. And you've got quite an interesting optimization problem here because what you really want is 239 plutonium if you're making a bomb. You don't want those heavier ones. In particular, you don't want much 240 because that can cause predetonation and is, is, makes life difficult. And this is, this is American data, but it, it tells the story quite clearly. <coughs> As the burn up, that is the irradiation time increases, so the quantity of plutonium you generate increases. And you can see that at very low burn ups, you're down at one or two hundred grams per ton of plutonium in your irradiated uranium. So that's a really very inefficient production process. So if you need six, seven, eight kilos for a primitive bomb, that's putting a lot of uranium through your reactor and your chem plant. So you can, op you can increase the yield of plutonium by pushing the burn up higher. And these numbers are the percentage of plut 239 in the plutonium product. You can see it goes from 99% down to 91 as you go from 100 to 1000 megawatt day per ton. And you can also see these little slices appearing at the top in lighter grey. These are the heavier isotopes starting to appear. So you've got this complex optimization of getting the maximum amount of plutonium without getting too much of the unwanted heavier isotopes. And typically the UK military stockpile it was produced in this region, 400 to 800 megawatt day per ton. Um, I'm conscious this is a physics audience primarily, so limited chemistry. 
And um, once you've got your irradiated fuel, you can do a whole bunch of chemistry to get the plutonium back. And this is a this is the first flow sheet using a, a hideous flammable solvent called Butex. It's quite complicated, it's messy, it's inefficient, but it did well enough. This is the plant in which it was done. And really quite clever because it was all gravity fed. You took the irradiated fuel up to the top, you dissolved it, and then basically all the flows were then just driven by gravity. That's one of the galleries inside. You can't see on this one the crappy old bathtubs at each end filled with water and algae, which were there for when the nitric acid pipe above your head failed and you got showered in nitric acid. Your response was to run to the end of the gallery and hurl yourself into this algae covered bath, uh, which would be a good plan if you were covered in nitric acid. <laughs> so it was all a bit a bit primitive, but it did the job. OK, you do your chemistry. The product of that chemistry is plutonium dioxide, which is this buff colored powder. That's not actually much use. So you go through some more processing. You convert it um, by reaction with um, hydrogen fluoride and fluorine gas to plutonium tetrafluoride, which you can then effectively smelt. So you put that into this a reaction vessel um, with uh, calcium metal, a dollop of iodine to increase the reaction temperature. You seal it all in, you heat it up, and the reaction goes. And so the reduction bomb. Sorry? I say bomb. Yes, it does. It's what's it's referred to as a reduction bomb. Yeah. Please don't tell me they put it. Is it explosive? Is no, it no, 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 it's, it's not. This, this is a picture of one. So it's in a a crucible, which is usually made of some of that magnesium oxide. So you can see the crucible's been broken open here, and you can see what's inside is the reaction products. So you've got the slag, which is calcium fluoride, and you've got the, the heavy plutonium metal has melted and sunk to the bottom and has now set as a, a lump of plutonium. So you can clean that up and you've got your metal. You melt it, you cast it, you make it into whatever shape you want, and all is good. And one of the things that pops up all the time when you're handling these fissile materials in quantity is if you have too much in the same place, then you get an unwanted fission reaction. It won't be an atomic bomb, but it will kill you. So, and there's a really cheerless book you can download on the internet which is an account of all known criticality accidents. And some of them are truly stupid. <laughs> um, the bottom, you can add to this list. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, I mean, so you, you go to a plute facility and you'll see signs like this. Do not have more than two and a half kilos of plutonium metal in this cabinet, because that means you cannot have a criticality accident. That's good. Um, and our transatlantic cousins, hence the little flag, carefully lined up a number of plutonium rods in a glove box to show how clever they were. And then somebody came along and said, do you realize that you are very, very close to a criticality accident? And that was just cretinous stupidity because they thought a nice row of plutonium rods would be good. So uh, don't if you if ever you're doing that, do not put too much plutonium in one place. It will end badly. Was limit empirical? Uh, two and a half kind of kilos. Yeah, it's, it's 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 very hard to see how you'd have a criticality with two and a half kilos of metal. Um, <coughs> very different in solution. Critical mass is much lower in solution for a whole bunch of physicsy reasons. Um, so you know, that's sort of the early story. The recognition that you could start to do things with that nuclear heat that current the piles were just chucking up the chimney. So this moved to what are called the Magnox reactors, which started over a 15 year period from 1956 to 1971. And they were in the jargon dual use in that they were efficient plutonium producers and could therefore be used to make military material if you chose, or you could actually take run them slightly differently, take the heat out and make electricity. And the first eight reactors, four at Calder Hall and four at Chapel Cross, were all quite low power reactors. And 
yes, you got electricity out of them, but let's be honest, this was more about weapons material. The later Magnoxes really represented a shift. They got they were bigger, so higher power, <coughs> and they were much more about electric electric power production and much less about military material production. And being brilliant about it, we built nine further sites and we put one pair of Magnox reactors on each site and no two pairs are the same. So we really didn't do fleet build, which I know is a Greg thing. Um, all of them ran on natural composition metal, uranium metal fuel. And that meant you had to reprocess it because the fuel is chemically unstable in storage. You can't dispose of it as waste if you store it in corrode. So you have to you have to reprocess it. The other thing is it limits the reactor temperature. A lower temperature actually means relatively inefficient electricity production. This is an interesting picture because it illustrates how different the Magnox reactors were. Yes, they were all Magnox reactors, but they did not take a range of different fuel rods. And if you're ever in Herder's house, the NDA's headquarters, which is a bit like, I don't know what, Sauron's lair or something, if you Lord of the Rings, um, then actually on the top floor, there is a plumbing grate cabinet with example fuel elements in there. So that's really quite cool. Did we not learn from the Americans doing the same thing, but with plutonium ones? We just were like, well, if we do it with our cans, it's cool. No, I think we were quite sensible, apart from building nine different types of reactor, effectively. So we have all this metal fuel coming out of the reactors. We have to reprocess it. <laughs> we had a thing called the Magnox reprocessing plant, which over its life, and it only finished a couple of years ago, put about 50,000 tonnes of fuel through, which is really quite spectacular production, actually. It did very, very well. The UK hasn't made military plutonium since the first half of the 1990s. We have enough. Um, and now we can't. We haven't got production reactors. We haven't got reprocessing plants. So we have to make do with what we've got. Um, as the emphasis became more and more on power and less and less on military material, we moved to a second generation of reactors, the advanced gas cooled reactors. And we, we built 14 of those, seven pairs, many of them different. And uh, I, I sort of like this quote, but it does make me slightly <laughs> ratty. One of the three worst civil investment decisions in the history of mankind. <laughs> It's not, doesn't say it was a well-founded decision. And, and the UK is responsible for one of the other two because because um, Concord is one of the yeah, other two. So the French. Don't forget that yeah, all right. So you can blame the French for half of Concord. Yeah. Francis, yeah? sorry, can I ask why exactly, please? Um, because they took so blooming long and were so blooming expensive. And I mean, I can't remember the numbers somebody in the audience may know, but something like Dungeon S was, I think, was the first to start building and was definitely not the first to come online. It was the last. So, so the, the theory is that PWI <coughs> would have been a lot cheaper and more. Well, I think, I, think, I think almost anything other than the AGRs. Though, ironically, having sort of taken that early financial hit, I think EDF would tell you they quite like the AGRs because they've just run them and run them and run them and what is it you make three quarters of a million a day out of running an agr so i think it depends on when you buy into the program if you're in at the beginning and you take all the, the pain bad plan if you come in later on and pick them up for relatively a song you're doing all right financially um so a bit more so AGR, so they use uranium dioxide fuel for reactor reasons, and they went to higher burn-ups, which means AGR material will have different plutonium isotopics. Because it's uranium dioxide, you don't need to reprocess it. You may choose to reprocess it, but you don't have to in the way you had to reprocess Magnol. And I believe someone was touting this as my chemical romance. So this is this this book would be 
I suppose, the first date in my nuclear romance, <laughs> in that I got hold of a copy in probably the mid-1970s, and it's full of the wonders of nuclear power and how fabulous it's all going to be and how you can use atomic weapons to, well, new, uh, atomic bombs to do large-scale civil excavations, those sorts of things. It's, it's of its time. It's an interesting read. I still have my copy. Um, but we were you know, looking ahead. Nuclear power was the coming thing. Lots of nations were embarking on it. Um, how much uranium is there? And this comes from 1976. So you've got some real data running through the 1970s and then projections about where uranium demand might go into the future. Um, and you can see that all the curves are very substantially upwards. And we ought to be, if you just blindly extrapolate, we ought to be getting on for half a million tons a year of uranium by now. We're not. Um, so, that, so people are starting to think uranium might run out of uranium. That's not a good thing. This is a piece written by the, the then Director General of the IAEA. What's the challenge of the 1980s? How to continue to develop nuclear power? But, no, sorry, I've got one guy in myself. So how might you use plutonium in a world where uranium is becoming scarce? One option is to replace the U-235, the fissile component in thermal reactor fuel with plutonium about 7% plutonium will do the job. You can take depleted uranium that isn't useful for very much. You can mix in plutonium with it, and you've got something that's got enough fissile content to make a decent thermal reactor fuel. And drawbacks are you've got to keep reworking that fuel. You reprocess it, you take the plutonium out, you blend it. So you have what was sometimes referred to as the plutonium economy, ton quantities of plutonium moving around this cycle which may not be desirable. And the other thing is that as you push plutonium round and round this cycle, so you see shifts in the isotopic composition and it actually becomes rather less useful. So down here in this little table, first time around you have this composition, 58%, 239. Second, if you take that same plutonium out and push it through a second time, you're down to 43% plus 239. So you're using up the fissile component and you're increasing the non-fissile component. And this is a phrase you don't hear very often. There is actually not enough plutonium. And um, if you think about it, reactor fuel might come out at 1% plutonium. You might separate 20 ton, you might take 20 tons a year out of a reactor per gigawatt. So that's around about a couple of hundred ton, kilo, kilograms of plutonium per year produced. But actually, you probably need 500 to 1500 kilograms per year to go back in. So actually, you don't have enough plutonium to just keep moving it round and round and round. The other approach is fast reactors. And so these are reactors where instead of using thermal neutrons, you're using neutrons that are moving much higher in energy. And they can fission isotopes that thermal reactors can't. In particular, they can fission U-238 and they can fission the non-fissile plutonium isotope. You can even tweak your reactor engineering so that it will make, make you more plutonium than it's used. And you can, you can do a bunch of stuff with, with the 140 tonne stockpile of plutonium the UK has. It would let you run a decent, a significant fast reactor fleet, several gigawatts worth. And the other thing it does is because you can now use depleted uranium as a fuel, your total energy resources increase massively. And the UK dabbled in fast reactors. It built two at Dune Ray, uh, one of which ran to 1977, and then the success of the, um, the prototype fast reactor, 74 to 94. So if for these reasons, plutonium and uranium may actually be quite useful materials. So this is a rationale for getting the plutonium back. How do you get plutonium back? You do some of that chemistry stuff. So this is Thorpe Thermal Oxide Reprocessing Plant. 
built on a much, much more crowded cell field site than the picture we saw earlier. And um, you do a whole bunch of chemistry I'm not going to bore you with. Construction was 79 to 94. It operated 97 through to 2018. It cost 1.8 billion in the 1980s when 1.8 billion pounds was a lot of money. And it was Europe's largest construction pro project. In that 20 odd years of operating life, it put through a bit under 10,000 tonnes of fuel. Contrast that with 50,000 tonnes that went through Magnox over its working life. So Magnox put a lot more fuel through. Uh, and a byproduct of that fuel throughput was 55 tonnes of separated plutonium. And then all those marvellous extrapolations in the IAEA hit the rocks with a vengeance. 1979, we had, who went to the, the nuclear now thing? Right, OK. So we heard about some of this stuff. Um, Three Mile Island in 1979 was not good. And Chernobyl in 1986, this lower picture, was really, really not good. Uh, there is some helicopter video recorded, a, a military helicopter flying over that with smoke coming out of the, the hole. And there's some agitated Russian and the soundtrack. And uh, I've seen a subtitled version and it says something like, go up, go a bit higher, please. And I've I've had a translation from a native Russian speaker. It's a lot, lot more animated. <laughs> <laughs> There's some very rude words in that. So, OK, so first half of the 1980s, two really bad things happen. And that has a massive impact on where nuclear is going. So this red line here is total reactors and you can see it going up, up, up from 1957. You, you've got the first half of the 80s here and then bang, it stops. So things that were in flight in the first half of the 80s were completed and then nothing more. So the number of reactors just stopped. Bang, that's it. And what does that mean for uranium demand? It means much the same. Black line is the only one that's of interest. You get to the late 80s and it flattens. So suddenly, civil nuclear stops dead. So, no, maybe plutonium isn't actually great. Uh, and if you know, the fast reactor end date for Doomray was 1994, because it was at that point it became obvious that there was no way the economics of fast reactors were going to work in a world where actually we just stopped doing nuclear. So we've got a lot of plutonium and um, this illustrates the different components. So Magnox has chugged away for a long time and produced a big dollop of it. Then you've got thought plutonium, some of which is foreign fuel and we store the plutonium derived from it, but it's still owned by that country, some of which has been transferred to the UK and some of which is UK owned. But you add all that lot up and we've got 140 tonnes. So in the short term, what can you do with it? Keep it safe, keep it safe, <coughs> that's all you can do with it. In the long term, you might want to make it into a waste form and dispose of it as waste, or you might find that actually there is a demand for it as fuel and you want to be able to make it into fuel. And policy position is at the moment, well, current policy is burning it as mixed oxide fuel is the preferred option with waste as plan B. Uh, that currently is under discussion. And I would refer you to this, there'll be a link later, but some of my colleagues in the Dalton Institute have done a big piece of work thinking about how you might actually do stuff with the UK's plutonium. So that's a little bit of what brings us more or less up to date. If we look ahead, this thing, the Climate Change Act, has had really a very substantial impact. Um, and I would also refer you to the Institute for Government's critique of the Climate Change Act, which basically says government signed up to this and its net zero implications without having a clue what it means. Uh, and I think we see some of that in the policy space subsequently. 
And in two, 2008, this is the UK energy mix. And an awful lot of it is fossil fuel and therefore not really acceptable in a net zero world. Coal has largely gone now, still use a lot of oil, petrol, diesel and the like, and we use an awful lot of gas. So this, the Climate Change Act is going to drive huge change in UK energy consumption, energy supply. And one of the things to be really clear about is that energy and electricity are not synonymous. Only about a quarter of our total energy is electricity. Three quarters of it is other stuff. And it, as you move to net zero and decarbonisation, you start to look at very different things for um, your energy mix. Hydrogen, or you might want to use heat directly, or you might continue to use fossil fuels, but combine it with carbon capture, that is the removal of CO2 from the exhaust gases and its geological isolation. And if you look at almost any, any credible publication, they will start to talk about how nuclear may play a role in this future energy mix. And this, this graph illustrates the scale of the problem. So the greens and the blues are energy sources that are compatible with net zero. The orange, the purple, the grey are not. So they're all hydrocarbon resources. So, and we're looking ahead to 2040. So looking out 15, 20 years, we are still seeing that the vast majority of global energy will come from hydrocarbon based sources. And that is very difficult to square that with net zero and um, carbon reductions. So that's a real conundrum that we currently face. And coming back to the UK, what does that mean? It means that we're interested in nuclear again. We have, as of last month, a civil nuclear roadmap, which starts to talk about where nuclear might go. And this is in the context of a peak of nuclear electricity production in the mid 1990s, when we had about 25% of our electricity being nuclear generated. And decarbonisation is, is likely to at least double and quite probably more than double electricity demand. We also have an increasing interest in energy security in a less secure world. And sorts of things that are being bandied about are 24 gigawatts of new nuclear by 2050. Potentially three to seven gigawatts of new of decisions on new nuclear every five years from the mid 30s onwards. Demonstration of advanced nuclear, but clearly stated in the roadmap, no use of plutonium in the short or medium term because the priority is actually to make sure it is safely and securely stored and we don't want to distract ourselves. If you look globally, you know, are we back to 1976? This, this is a, from the World Nuclear Association. The only bits of the interest really are the highlighted numbers. 436 reactors in operation worldwide, 62 being built. 114 planned, 326 proposed. So even allowing for the fact that some of these will fall off, you're looking at a substantial expansion of nuclear going forward. Are we finally seeing that curve kicking back up again? Who knows? And what does that mean for the UK's plutonium stockpile? Is it a resource? Is it an embarrassing waste? Where are we? We're not separating any more plutonium. The reprocessing plants are shut down. The stockpile is actually quite well on the way to being safely and securely stored. But at the moment, we can't make plutonium materials for civil use. We can't make mixed oxide fuel. We can't make any plutonium waste forms. We don't actually need to make a quick decision, which is just as well because we couldn't implement it for probably a couple of decades. 
but when we make that decision, it will be a very, very big decision and it will be a very, very expensive decision. And what we need to do is we need to be sure that we can underpin whatever that decision is. We also need to underpin the decades of storage of plutonium materials that precede that end point, whatever it might be. There's the advert for our position paper on plutonium. If you want an interesting read, please read it. Uh, and I'll shut up. Thank you very much for your attention. Fusion girl. Well, I've got loads of questions. One was, so you know that book you, that inspired you to? Yeah. Was that a fusion tokamak on the front cover? Uh, or some it, kind of? I, yeah, it could well be. I mean, it, the book's 1971, yeah. so it's sort of ancient history of fusion world. But yeah, it's about fission and fusion and all things nuclear. Okay. Um, so my, one of my questions is, so I think you mentioned that LWRs is the uh, preferred usage of the plutonium ore. Yeah. For the long term. Why is it limited to LWRs only? Well, at the moment, LWRs are the only game in town for the UK. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got um, Sizewell C. Yeah. Uh, we're building Hinkley. We might probably build Sizewell. Who knows? But they're all light water reactors. Because okay. that comes back to the future. I probably have told you this before, Francis. If we, because at the moment the tritium for fusion comes from can do. Uh, yeah. Reactors and fusion says that they will breed the tritium in their fusion first generation of fusion reactors. But even if they do, I don't think it will be uh, enough. Is there anyone who would be interested in building, not necessarily can do, but can do type reactors, and then using that fuel, getting some clean energy along the way with those reactors and right. generating tritium? Sorry, I'm not going to go off on a tritium rack. So I'll let, if you want to go off on one, I'll let you. Know. Um, I mean, if you look at what the Americans do, they they use their light water power reactors to make their tritium. Uh, at the moment, they they put lithium aluminate ceramic rods in, and then they fish them out and process them. So you can actually use a power reactor to make tritium. I suspect that I think it's Tennessee Valley Authority run that run those reactors. I suspect that the American government pays through the nose for putting the TP bars into in, into those reactors. Uh, it's really it is really hard because I think if I were if I were trying to build a UK fission rick plant, I would want no distractions because anything will be it will mess up my safety case, my planning, my regulatory justification. And all I want to do is get this bill and switched on because that's when I start to make the money I need to pay the many billions of pounds that I owe somebody. And anything else I think would be seen as a distraction. Kath, I'll come back to that. Uh, so I think at the very start of your slides, we have the conversation around uranium to unify enrichment being incredibly energy intensive. Yeah. Um, has anyone, I'm sure they have, uh, what are the figures for plutonium separations and energy per, per unit mass? And does that compare to the energy that, that you require for uranium separation? Oh, that's a good question. I'm sure people have looked at it. Um, I've got him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go out to tritium now, watch it. <laughs> no, no, no. My, my, my gut feel is if you look at sort of megajoules in versus megajoules out, the energy content of plutonium is so huge that you get, you would say, you know, I put this much in, I get this much out, and it looks like the you get a lot more out than in. But you have to make it effective use of those, if you like, potential yeah. megajoules, because, you know, you've got to have a reactor to burn it in, you've got to have a fuel plant, you've got to have a whole bunch of other stuff. So the 
I suppose it's the life cycle cost of a plutonium fuel cycle, which people must have done, probably Greg's done it. Um, just giving me the look. Um, I'll leave it with you. But, <laughs> yeah, but you do get, I mean, I mean, it's an argument that's made about just uranium fuel cycle that you put a lot of energy in to get to get back what you do. Well, that's a few percent. I th but I think I think there the balance is very much on the <clears throat> it is beneficial to do it. I, I, I just think, yeah, a lot of it is hypothetical on plutonium energy yield. Problem. Oh, absolutely it is. I mean, at the moment we're looking at the plutonium <clears throat> and we're getting nothing out of it. Well, we're spending a lot of money looking at it. <laughs> oh yes, 70 million a year security costs. What, 600 million for a flute store? Probably end up now. Just stick it in a reactor, the cheap one. No reactors to put it in. Make one quickly. I'll give it to French. They'll find something to do with it. <coughs> Long source of flute. Bloody French in their brand. <laughs> <laughs> any more for any more? I'm oh, sorry, Adrian. Yeah. Am I right in remembering that or thinking that plutonium was used in early hard pacemakers? Yes. Um, are there any other uses for plutonium, either real or potential, outside of the fuel cycle? I did this some once. I think you could give every person on Earth 11 smoke detectors with plutonium sources in, <laughs> and you'd just about use up the UK fuel um, plutonium <laughs> stockpile. <laughs> so there you go, there's one. Um, Innovation. It's used in uh, like heating up rovers, it's used as RCGs. Oh, like, that's different plutonium. Why is everything different plutonium? <laughs> uh, that's that's two three eight, which you because uh, it's short lived and and is very is very very self heating. Uh, so if you look if you see blue two thirty eight pictures, lumps of it are glowing cherry red from self heating, and that that's why it's useful. Um, but you actually make blue two thirty eight by separating neptunium two thirty seven from your fuel and reactor irradiating that and then separating the plutonium from the Neptune. But bulk plute does not have many uses. And I like, so, so you mentioned briefly that the last whiff of official policy said that preferentially yeah. uses MOX yes. is still preferred. Am I right in that that's dated to 2011? Yes. Is there, is there any sort of smell as to the next official direction, uh, purely because like, it's an interesting um, time to, to be looking at the, the landscape of fuel. Yeah, I think um, MOX, MOX use looks increasingly implausible and the justification for Hinkley does not include MOX, it's uranium fuel only. I can't see Sizewell C being any different. Um, Sizewell B has no ability to burn MOX. Um, you'd have to pay the owner of the reactor a bucket of money to get them to burn your MOX, even if you could make it, which we can't because we don't have a working MOX <coughs> plant. So it's very difficult, 12 years on from that policy position, to see any practical way you could make and irradiate MOX fuel in less than about 25 years, possibly yes. at huge costs. So therefore, maybe you might start to think more seriously about disposal as waste with, if someone comes along and can make the economic case for fuel, then we'll do it, as, well then we'll do fuel. Yeah, so, so is the disposal MOX concept, is that changing, not necessarily the attitude in terms of MOX usage, but for MOX manufacture and establishing indigenous MOX manufacture capability? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. DMOX is a very different beast. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I think what we'll do is we'll store it for about 20 years. Well, we have to because we, we, we don't, we have any choice. And then we will make a decision and that decision will be MOX. But whether it is fuel MOX or disposal MOX, I don't know. But I think the UK will build a, a MOX plant for one or other of those products. Um, and it does pain me to say it, I think right now my money would be on disposal. I think there's increasingly a view that the stockpile is an unwanted byproduct from an obsolete fuel cycle that will cause more pain 
that it's worth to get rid of? Probably worth saying that size will be did have the capacity to burn walks when it was built. Yes. And it has uh, since had that removed, basically because there was no um, prospect of it becoming economic for it. And I think it would be worth saying that when those astronomical lines of uranium, there were price lines of uranium that were equally astronomical. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, the whole thing was predicated on rapid growth yeah. nuclear. And once that didn't happen, every, all the bets were off. Yeah. And it only really took a shonky Russian reactor to change the world in many ways. <coughs> Another question. Um, so one thing I was really impressed with was how quickly everything happened at the, the beginning. And I guess that was in the context of the Manhattan Project and uh, yeah. war and, and things like that. Um, and then also that along the way, we may have lost a lot of the knowledge that things have, have closed down, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, do you think we can regain that knowledge and do things just as quickly today, especially with climate change being quite a big driver? Or do you think those days have gone and we will be able to do things as, as quickly again? Right, I wish this wasn't being recorded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, so this will be the recorded answer. Okay. Um, I think, yes, we could. Um, and if you look, the, there is a, a fascinating document that you can find on, on the web, which is what William Penny put down. So, so he was told, go build us an atomic bomb. And he wrote down all the things I need for an atomic bomb. And what do we know about it? And what do we not know about it? And there was stuff like, we don't know plutonium metallurgy. And plutonium metallurgy is a horrendous nightmare. Um, and they worked out all these problems really very, very quickly. And I think if we really put our minds to it, yes, we could. Uh, and you've got to think of the context. I mean, they were doing this in a, a nation that had just done six, fought a six year war, was economically and physically really not in a good place. But government said, this is so important, we're going to do it. And it happened. Um, I think there are a bunch of things we could do to, to accelerate this. I think we, I mean, it's not being woke, but I'm sure some of our politicians would see it as such. Uh, we do have an extraordinarily complex planning, regulatory justification process. The There's a new Dartford tunnel being built. And there is a document or set of documents that's been produced to meet their reg their regulatory obligations, which is over 300,000 pages. So somebody has spent a lot of time and money writing 300,000 pages. Someone else is going to spend a lot of time and money reading 300,000 pages. Then they'll spend a lot of time and money arguing about the contents of 300,000 pages. To what extent you could take some of that out of the process, I don't know. But the fact that it's in there is more around politics, law, regulation than real safety and real environmental benefit. I think there's a lot of stuff that's just done cause, and I, I don't think that helps anybody. That's the PC version of my answer. I think we're out of time. I think it's off three o'clock. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to gossip afterwards if anyone wants, but Go on, we, have the, we have the room for another hour. I wasn't planning that.